Welcome to another episode of the Tech Matters Podcast, sharing our vast business and development experience with developers like you, helping you to create better products, better businesses, and we hope a better you. Now, author and award-winning mobile innovator, your host, Stephen Feather. I'm thrilled to be joined today with my good friend, Patrick Shetta. Patrick and I have been trying for a couple of years to collaborate on a number of projects, and it looks like 2017 may actually be that year. To begin with, uh, Patrick will be joining me for the Tech Matters FM broadcast, and some weeks he will host alone or will co-host or I'll host alone, depending on the subject matter. Uh, We have a few other projects that we aren't quite ready to announce yet, but uh, you'll hear about them here first, so make sure you subscribe. Patrick, welcome, and uh, tell our listeners a little bit about yourself. Thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Patrick Shetta. Uh, I am CTO of Coligo Vox, mobile solutions consulting company. I'm based out of Atlanta, uh, but most of my career I was based out of Chicago, which uh, main industry in Chicago is finance, so uh, that was where I spent most of my time, uh, either trading systems, uh, financial investments, things like that. Uh, past uh, maybe five or six years, uh, I've been focused solely on mobile and mobile solutions, backends, things like that, having to do with mobile. And um, I think that it, I will lend myself well to things that we have to discuss in this uh, broadcast. So uh, thank you for having me. Now, you and I get asked this question a lot, both in our personal and our professional lives. Folks will just walk up to you and say, I've got a great idea for an app. What do you think? Uh, Let's spend this episode discussing how we go about pre-qualifying an idea. Uh, What's the first thing you think of? What's the first area that you kind of address? Yes, we most certainly uh, do get approached um, about app ideas. Um, I think that the very first thing that pops in my head is what is the motivation? What is this client's motivation for wanting this app? Um, what is what's the story? Why why do they need it? Do they need it? You know where do, where is the history up to the point that they're speaking with me? Um, so that's usually the discussion that I start. And you assume that they have some ownership in an idea or have seen a need somewhere. I would assume that yes. Okay. Um, and how you know how does this benefit them? How does it benefit someone else? And, and the story is important later on when we get to marketing, which we'll discuss, uh, because that's a big selling point. What is the, the personal aspect to a particular product? Um, how about usefulness? Uh, one of the things that I think about is, would I ever use this product? Um, but earlier this year, uh, Benedict uh, Evans of Anderson Horowitz actually tweeted something out that was said, the easiest trap in consumer tech is to confuse, I don't like it and I don't have that use case with that's a bad product and it'll fail. There are a lot of things that we've written over the years that we would never use. Um, It's difficult to work on some of those projects because you don't understand it. It is. And I I kind of am picky about the apps that I use. And for me, myself, to want to use an app, it's really got to wow me uh, functionally, uh, aesthetically, really has to improve my life. So I have a very small subset of apps that I say, this is great, and I need this. So what that does is when someone approaches me, it, it has me put on my, my, you know, my skeptical hat. And, and when someone says, I really need this product, and then I, like you said, is this something that I would use? And I can really uh, use that to, to get out of them why is it that you need this? Because I'm not seeing why I would need this. So, so personally for me, I think it's a benefit that I can use to, to get to the point. We've worked on our firm on three, three different um, haircut apps over the last eight years. And obviously I don't use their product, um, not because I don't like the product or have no interest, but I just don't have the need. Um, and same thing. I've had to really delve into their business model, their approach, who their customers are, and sometimes overthink stuff so that I had a better understanding of where they were at. So we've talked about motivation. We've talked about usefulness. Um, third thing, competition. That's a that's a big deal when somebody brings you an idea. You want to share a little bit about? Yes. Um, I think that we have to be 
hypercritical of uh, someone coming to us and and really be convinced that they've done their homework as far as competition because it's a very competitive field uh, in just about any app that you want to create. It's probably been done. So you really need to have done your, your homework and see what other people are doing. Why is yours better or different? Why do you think you're going to uh, dethrone th- these other apps? Or, or maybe you don't think you're going to dethrone them. You have something special or different, or maybe even more limited features than these other apps have. And, and you believe that uh, your competition has too many features and that you could succeed by having less features. I've seen that happen. So knowing the competition, having done your homework, you really have to do that before you can move forward or else you're going to waste a lot of time and money. And we're talking ease and barrier of entry. It's really easy to write an app, but maybe the infrastructure required for that's a little more complicated. Let's let's use crowdsourced ride sharing, that kind of stuff. Uh, ride sharing specifically, there are two large uh, gargantuans in the market, if you would. You've got Uber and Lyft both fighting with each other. And if you're looking at just their numbers, you have to say, okay, I can build an app that does what they do. I can build a back end, but do I have the money? They're, they're already funded. Do I have the money to go and recruit both drivers and customers? So you're marketing to two different classes of folks that you need both classes for your business model to work. Um, And then just recently, Google, who acquired um, Waze, pulls that into their map application and now has included Uber links inside of Google Maps, and they're planning on releasing sometime this year ways with free ride sharing or something like that. So now you've got this third party that you may not have had on your radar suddenly just pop in. And when you're talking Google, you're talking huge amount of money. They don't have to go get funded. They just pull it out of capital, you know, cash somewhere and fund a new department. So you're looking at that. Um, how about release cycles in apps? Uh, You and I talked a little bit about that before we got started. How important is knowing your competition's release cycle? Right. For me, it's extremely important. Uh, If I have an app that I like to use a lot and I see that they're releasing regularly, for example, Facebook, very regular, probably the most regularly released app that I have. I think it's on a two-week cycle. They don't always give the details of what they've done, you know, bug fixes, improvements, things like that. It's kind of vague. But it gives you confidence as the user of the app that it there is a heartbeat, there is a pulse to the company. They're concerned about the quality and perception of their app, and they're constantly updating it and, and working on it as far as me, the consumer, is concerned. So it is, is definitely something to look at. Um, if you've used apps and they don't get updated for months and years, and although it may seem to be working correctly. There is a little hesitation in the back of your mind that something's wrong here. Maybe maybe it's just coincidentally working and the company has gone away. Maybe, you know, it could break at any time. But there certainly is a comfort to seeing a uh, irregular release cycle. Absolutely, absolutely. And then you and I have talked a little bit about product polish. Uh, there's a when you're looking at the feature sets, you're looking at maybe I can create exactly the same thing, but mine's going to look better. And I'm not going to have to take as much time to do marketing. I'm not going to have to spend as much money because I really do have a polished product. Uh, We think about cars and you look at BMWs, Mercedes, and then Lexus suddenly moves into this gap. And Lexus actually comes from a non-luxury line. They're the top end of a consumer grade product. Whereas BMW and Mercedes have always been that top tier automotive customer. Lexus and their parent look at them and say, we can take that space or move into that space. So same thing applies with an app. I think that you can sit and say, I've got something that I can polish this and make it look a lot better than the competition and have the same features and maybe have a bigger market, take a piece of their market. I, I would agree with that. Um, so we've talked about motivation. We've talked about usability. Let's talk a little bit about um, technology and competition. Let's talk a little bit about technology. Uh, what's one of the first questions you think about when somebody brings you an idea? <laughs> first question, technology-wise, is what platform are you aiming for? 
Are you aiming for iPhone or iOS only? Android only? Maybe Windows devices if you're in enterprise. Maybe that's a very important thing. But you definitely have to know that. Um, there are uh, shops out there, like Stephen and myself, who try to focus on uh, producing cross-platform solutions. So that's definitely a bonus, but not all shops are that way. And some shops will refuse to do certain platforms. So it is an important question up front, technology-wise. What's your what's your goal? What's your end consumer who's using it? What's their devices? That That's a big one. If we sat and said, hey, I'm going to do a BlackBerry app in the United States, that may not be a big deal. You're going to want to probably think about who the user is in the U.S. But if you said, I'm never going to do BlackBerry, you probably just caught off a huge part of your European customer base because those phones are used widely there. Same thing for Asia right now. iOS, because of its, uh, iPhones, because of their price tag, aren't very big in the Asian market, but Android devices are. So if you say, I'm launching worldwide, you need to really think about what platform you're hitting. If you're hitting the U.S. and you want to start off with one platform, okay, choose one. But definitely got to make that consideration. Um, and, and I think it's a serious problem that I see with, with mostly working with United States clients is they don't consider worldwide. They don't think the long game as to where, where the product's going to end up. Me and my friends, hey, we all have iPhones. I'm going to target iPhone only. And that's, that's bad thinking. We see that, too, um, even in regional areas. I'm in New York. I'm in San Francisco. iPhone is it. Uh, well, you step outside of the little bubbles of the metro areas, and you really start to see uh, those numbers and percentages change in your iPhone and Android relationships. And, and that's where we come in, and we can sit and help a client make those decisions. Um, Competitively complex. Now, this was interesting. You brought this up in regards to a product that you actually worked on, which gave you some insight into that. Do you want to share about that? Right. So um, some of the things that I have focused on in the past is uh, children's games. And I I was working on a a new idea that had to do with uh, some physics, um, natural physics movement uh, simulating a real world. Now, I didn't think that I really needed to pull in a, a full physics engine, um, which for this type of movement I have not experimented with. So I said, well, I can I can simulate this uh, just using views and animations and things like that. And I dove into it, not spending too much time, but I was able to get it to kind of simulate what I wanted, but I just kept sitting in the back of my head that I really need to incorporate... Uh, physics engine to make this work, um, but the complexity for integrating it into the app and the time for for me or or one of my developers to figure out how to make this thing work, uh, it was going to be some significant time. And this particular project was going to be an in-house project. Uh, uh, some of the games that I do are are in-house releases only and not for clients. And we just kind of uh, shelved it. For it was just too complex and going to take too much time to figure out how to make this thing look natural, as opposed to just moving forward and pushing the the limits uh, of the platforms, and then it starts to get clunky. And then when you're too far down that road, you're going to have to refactor it, and then and then the amount of time is just going to explode. And I, and I've got a story from exactly the opposite side where we inherited a project where somebody had decided they needed something really complex. And the only way they could do that was to put a game engine in just to run their menu. Um, they were way over-engineered and they didn't do a really good job when, by the time we got it, we had to fix the math and everything, <laughs> but to sit and say, I'm going to use a game engine just for my uh, menu and everything else for standard windows and views was, is just kind of ludicrous to, to think, but we, we managed to fix it and make it work. Um, other things you're looking at, if, if you're going to be building your business, do you own the entire stack? So when you're looking at that, you're saying, are you going to be relying on third-party APIs, some other vendor? Um, that's that's a huge concern because when you go to a VC, you don't own everything. Um, how often have you run into that problem where APIs have disappeared or something like that? I, I wouldn't actually say that I've had it as a problem, but I certainly consider it. So um, there was a client I was working with that was 
um, focusing on one or two APIs that they had found online. And, you know, it was slightly documented and apparently this was exactly what these apps needed. But you go and look at the sites and they're thrown together. They haven't been updated for three or four years. And from a technology point of view, I look at it, what's going on on the other side of this API? Are they just, you know, scraping someone else's website? Are they pulling data out of a text file? There's just not confidence that this is a, a long-running API that you might get from Facebook or something, that it's going to exist, and at any time it could just go away, and then the client's app is just dead and keeps showing no data or what, whatever your error message would be. It's absolutely unacceptable. And um, it really makes me nervous when I see that type of thing. Although the features are usually very cool, um, you know, some type of app that you might not normally uh, see or work on. So as as a, a shop, you are kind of excited to see this new thing work. But boy, that I want the confidence that that API is stable and, and long-term. And we're seeing more and more products that are built against somebody else's platform as a service or software as a service. And uh, the, the biggest one in recent years was uh, Parse. Everybody was using them because they were easy to roll stuff out. Uh, they had a a really nice interface for adding your data, uh, looking at your data, browsing it, and then their API worked very well. And then one day they get acquired, they make their money, and uh, you know, props to those guys. They worked hard to get to the point where somebody would buy them out. We look two years after the buyout, and, well, the buyer decides they're going to cut them off. Fortunately, they also released the server so you could, software so you could go move it to your own platform. But there were a lot of folks that were stuck in the middle who didn't have the technical expertise to do that. So now you've got your product based on a foundation that somebody else owns. It's like building on rented land, so to speak. <laughs> and that that really does concern me when folks aren't looking at building out their own APIs and servers. Uh, security. You and I have both worked on some very secure products. We can't talk about all of them. But what are some of the things that need to be addressed when a client's bringing an idea to you? Yeah, first of all, have they thought about it? Um, <laughs> it's a great great way to start. Very good very good starting point. Um, I've worked on some financial apps where uh, super huge billion-dollar, multi-billion-dollar companies that want to develop an app, and they have not even thought about security. They haven't looped in that team uh, to discuss it. And there's some things that, that I have to do up front, um, either... either uh, in memory tricks and things like that to to have in place so that even when they start rolling this out to internal people for testing that it's not immediately in violation of some type of security things so of course i'm talking about data in data at rest security here um but it you really <laughs> you really can't ignore that you can't wait till the end of the product to say uh, you know, the security team has contacted us and there's a big, huge problem and you're just about to press the submit button to the app store. Uh, that's not good. Um, you know, data in motion, uh, securing, um, you know, the techniques for, well, even like, you know, logins and auth authentication, authorization, things like that. Y you can't put that off. It it needs to be up front. And, and maybe that's our responsibility as ethical uh, app creators to bring that up early on and not only bring it up, but if it's pushed off, uh, we'll worry about that later to pull it back and say, you can't worry about that later. I, I would agree with that too. Often we get products. Um, you know, we've actually inherited some projects and we've turned some down based upon the security. Uh, we had one come to us recently and the app itself was not using SSL data was stored on the device insecure. And we're talking about an app that was taking credit card information uh, we did an audit of their server, and so not only did you have credit card information entering the app, being transmitted in clear text across the wire, being it was actually being stored in their database on their API server uh, in clear plain text. And at that point, we said we're not interested in continuing because you guys haven't, you know, we ha you haven't even thought through this. And when we brought it up to the the prospect, they had no understanding of how serious that was and for us that was a, a no-go at that point because i don't we didn't believe we were going to be able to argue that point hard enough uh, they just never were going to accept that 
But we're talking about data at rest on a device, data in trans, or, uh, data in motion over the wire, and we're talking data at rest on an API. And you've got to secure all of those if you're looking to be PCI compliant, if you're taking uh, credit card information. In your games, uh, you work with children's games, so you've got to be COPA compliant. Is that right? That is absolutely true, and I was, I was going to bring that point up uh, when you said PCI compliance. So it's kind of the, the same thing as uh, PCI compliance in business apps, but the COPA compliance in, in um, children's apps, uh, and it literally stands for, I believe, Children's Online Privacy and Protection Act. And one of the things that we do is treat it with huge respect and don't try to get around it in any way. Um, and the things that we do are um, no data collection of any kind with personal information. Now, we do analytics that help us solve problems and, and see how people are using the app in maybe sections they're not using it. No personal data collection, no emails, anything like that. Uh, no, no sneaky camera stuff, any of that. Um, and in fact, in the app, there is no way to get out of the app without closing it. So there's no ads. Absolutely no ads. There's no um, click here to go to a website. Um, at one time, I did have it go to a uh, a COPA website to explain some privacy things. But since then, I've brought them into the app so that everything you need is in the app. Um, a child, especially a younger child, cannot go anywhere where basically outside of the fence. You fence in the area. They can't leave it unless they back out of the app. And, and that's a good way to think about when you're designing the app. And we're, we have a, actually listed as a separate episode later on this year. But one of the things Apple has done for schools is allowed schools to sandbox applications and sandbox iPad devices so that if you've got a child that logs in, they're limited in what they can do. And if they audit your app, they know that yours is not one of those places that's going to leak to the outside world, a way for a student or a, a child to get out past whatever they've got locked down hidden browsers, those kind of things that may not be intentional, but happen when you start throwing web views out there and that kind of stuff. Um, other things we've talked about is how complex is the app? How many moving parts are there? Uh, is this so complicated that one small piece is going to bring everything down like a, a house of cards? Uh, we've both seen some projects where as things just get bigger and bigger, you're sitting there and as the dev who's on a small piece, you're kind of, oh, I just don't know about this. This is starting to get a little iffy. Um, Yes, um, <laughs> we've definitely uh, seen some issues where uh, the certain things have to happen uh, for security reasons uh, when an app is paused. So on an iPhone, when you hit the home button, the app you know is paused from execution um, and minimizes um, some requirement that some things have to happen during that, as well as when you resume back. Um, there's security issues about um, the screen capture that happens just before the app is closed and is displayed as the app's coming up. So my point being, you have to, uh, this particular app had to um, monitor for the pause and resume events, network events, and and that's all fine, except in the app, there was some functionality that had to be called out on a regular basis to check for um, re new revisions of some some data and some things that needed to be updated in the app. And those also were triggered off of some of the pause and resume events. So what ended up happening is some little changes to some parts of the app are affecting the other parts of the app, and they're not clear what's happening because they're not coupled in any way, but they're being triggered off of similar events. And you can run into complexity with that if things need to be fired in a particular order. Uh, sometimes the, uh, the OS events... They'll, they'll go in whatever order they want to because the, the OS is determining who gets called first. So there's huge complexity in that. We run into huge um, breaking changes that you just cannot figure out why. All I did was update this one call, this one HTTP call that maybe took longer and it affected the whole asynchronous property of the app. Huge problem. Uh, we finally figured out what it was and got the whole uh, calling order in order to, to be how we wanted it. But the complexity of that really, really bit us uh, by not thinking ahead how uh, seemingly disparate things were affecting each other. And you inherited part of those problems that when we talk about architecture um, and design later on, that you've 
would be, have been able to solve those earlier had you had full control from day zero. That's true. Okay. And right. it's also situations like that that I kind of uh, learn from and put in my bag of tricks for the next time. So even if I don't use it the next time, I can be thinking about it and say, well, here's this technique or, or design pattern or some idiom or something that we really needed for this and it saved us. Just put it in my tool belt and bring it out next time and, and don't forget it. Along those lines, experience matters. Yeah, very much. Uh, if you're a new dev who just stepped out of a boot camp, you probably haven't seen all of these things and don't know how to w- r- get ahead of them. Um, fifth thing, let's talk a little bit about revenue streams and we're not going to sit too long here, but one of the questions we ask is how are you financing this? How are you funding this? Where are you making your money? Um, is this a goodwill app or do you hope to turn a profit off this? And you know, what's your business model for your, your technical product, so to speak? What are a couple of the more popular things you've seen as far as revenue streams go? Um, well, I, I'd like to comment on what you said. Most people would say, yes, I plan to make money off of this. And your question, what's your business model? The, usually the answer is, I don't know. Exactly. I just want to make a lot of money. Unfortunately. So um, it is very important uh, question. So, for example, if you're a startup and uh, perhaps you're writing something to compete with an Uber or something like that, uh, some some brokering site where money's uh, transferred, um you really have to have your business model down and you, and and if you're starting something like that, it's probably not a weekend hackathon project that you just hope, you know, Mark Cuban is going to come in and and buy for a billion dollars because that's not going to happen. What you really are thinking about hopefully is I want to grow this as a sustainable business. And I truly believe that I can dethrone these other competitors, but your business model better be strong. What is, What's your revenue? How are you going to do it? Especially one of these brokering apps. Very hard to get customers. Um, the uh, the Ubers, uh, dating apps. Uh, you need the customers using the app, and you need the people supplying the services. And we've heard stories about some dating apps that when they start up, they didn't actually have enough people to fill in you know, the dating scenarios, and they kind of were set up. But especially brokering apps... Um, Getting getting your financial uh, goals and models in place is critical, and you really <laughs> you really need to have a good business sense or know someone who has a business sense who's willing to help you. Because I personally find that it's hard hard to get it right. I would agree with that. Absolutely agree with that. Uh, are you going to run ads? Are you taking a piece of the action? Um, I I personally can't stand ads, and if I have an app that I'm using, I'm willing to pay for any app purchase to get rid of ads. Uh, My son loves ads, apparently, uh, because he likes, in games, popping in and out to other games and deciding what he wants to download. Um, That's just two different personalities, two different generations, age groups, desires, everything else. Ads I find intrusive and annoying. And in most cases, on my Android, if we're talking mobile, uh, I actually run a full OS ad blocker to kind of keep all that away. So your ads aren't going to be seen or your app's not going to work and I'm not going to use it. So that's something else that you need to consider if you're thinking ads are going to be your your, your revenue stream. Um, I've always likened it to uh, somebody standing inside of Sears and handing out coupons for Kmart as they walk in the door. You know, they, yeah, they're making money off handing out coupons for Kmart, but you're trying, you're running your customers off to somebody else's property. Um, so ads, you probably won't get a lot of positive feedback from me on ads anyway Uh, and i'm Um, I'm in the same boat as you 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 feel the same way (laughs) yes uh how about gamification inside of an app you from somebody who has done games how do you keep somebody keep using your app continue to uh utilize it after download right and i've done i've done a lot of thinking and and research into gamification uh and motivation for using apps and things and i think that it in general it's a good idea so if you are, I, I th- first thing that comes to mind is, is um, exercise apps. Uh, so it's not normally something that someone um, is going to probably do a lot. So the, the average person who says, I really need to start running again, and they, they get the app you know, from the big issue vendor, and, and they're the perfect person that they need the gamification in there 
for the motivation. Um, you go to your friend who's, you know, an avid runner daily and runs marathons and things. They probably just want it to track times, and they don't need that at all for motivation. Uh, so, so the gamification is an element that I think is useful for for many cases, and um, although I do think that it has to be done right. So there are apps that I feel uh, are doing gamification um, in a way that, for me as a user, don't do anything for me. So I know that um, yourself and myself, we use the Swarm app, and you know you get coins. For- Which used to be Foursquare, so they've yes. rebranded from something to something we don't know. Yeah, good. <laughs> exactly. And, and, and if you've ever had any time around me when we're discussing Swarm, I... I don't usually have good things to say about the Foursquare and Swarm gamification in there because I don't quite get it. So it's kind of clear that you can get some coins for checking in and you can redeem the coins for in-app stickers, I guess, or badges or something. Upgrades, yeah. But but from that point, I don't get it. So I don't walk over to Steven and say, look, let's compare stickers. Um, I don't get any type of, you know, you've checked in 30 times at this particular coffee shop, they're going to offer me a free coffee. Um, maybe their their own app does that, but not, you know, not these apps, the, the check-in apps. So for me, it's kind of fun. I like to see where people are. But Stalker I, type. I, yeah, yeah, I stalk people. I, yeah. I have stalked Steven before. Um, but I don't quite relate to the way the gamification is done. So, so knowing that example... Uh, and then also knowing the example of an exercise app, I I believe that it's useful, but it needs to be done well, and it really needs to resonate with with the target user. And, and this requires a lot of pre thought before you decide that that's what you're going to add to your app. You can't just say, "I'm um, down the road, we're going to gamify this app." Okay. Do you have somebody who's an expert in those areas? You've actually done a talk in the past on gamification. I think you've done it at uh, ConnectJS. Uh, maybe have shared it with uh, DevNexus and either of those two. Yes. You could find that online on YouTube. I think those are listed. Um, let's talk a little bit about rewards, which kind of comes from the gamification. We've just mentioned that a little bit. Um, what's the What kind of rewards are you going to set up? You mentioned I've got the stickers inside of the app. Is that a reward enough for me to continue using it? Or if I have 10 check-ins within your app, your specific business app, do I get a free coffee? Um, Do I get a free ride with Uber? Um, If I'm sharing that with somebody and I get points to share an an app, I suddenly get a free Uber ride. Those have tangible value outside of the digital world. Uh, I think that's something that definitely needs to be considered as your second step to gamification. You, you've got to have the reward to go with the gaming. Yes, and, and I love apps that do re- rewards correctly. Uh, exactly the, the examples you just gave. I love that. And as a user of the app, it does motivate me to keep using it. Uh, even, if, even if the reward is a, a dollar off your next meal or something, really it might be a restaurant that I only go to once a week, but after I've been going there for a few months and I get a dollar off, it's just a nice feeling. You know, I can I can afford that dollar, but it's a nice feeling. It says, hey, these guys care about me. They want me to come back. Um, I know that there's a, a ice cream shop that I used to go to who since went out of business, but they, um, they had excellent reward system. Uh, it was a point system, and you could redeem them for things as you go along. But one thing that, that they incorporated was uh, push notifications so that you um, maybe hadn't visited in a while. Uh, they see that you come there more often that you than you redeem your points. So they might send a message about that, reminding you, you know, you can use these. Next time you come, why don't you use those for a free cone? That doesn't do anything for, uh, for, for them getting dollars on my next visit, but it's, it is a way to remind me of them and remind me that I like them, which I did, and go in and I go in and say, hey, I get a free cone. So um, I, I love the reward systems that are done well. I, I would agree with that. I absolutely agree with that. Uh, it, it's about loyalty. My loyalty to a brand has been appreciated. And I think too often, even the big stores are kind of missing that. Uh, it's it, it used to be that way. You were a, 
a regular customer or you were a, a privileged customer or there were some tag for the number of times you've been you visited a store uh, brick and mortar and the digital world's kind of missed that a little bit uh, I agree. So, uh, last thing I want to talk about a little bit data as a byproduct both as a revenue stream and as a value to the organization uh, a lot of data comes out of mobile and desktop app usage. There's a lot of stuff that we could pour over. And one of the things that we need to think about is the privacy concerns with that. Is, is that a, a viable um, asset that we can monetize by e- either in aggregate taking that data and analyzing it, or even specifically there are folks out there selling specific customer information? I know you took a ride, you went to these places, so we're going to sell your name to somebody else. Um, so data as a byproduct is what I call it. Um, I'm not sure what anybody else would call it, but that's pretty much what it is. Uh, now, in fin- fi- financial tech, you probably don't have a lot of that because they try to keep everything in-house. Um, with the game, you wouldn't have done that because you don't want to sell any of that children's information. But we see that a lot in uh, a lot of the startups we deal with is they actually sit and say, hey, I wonder what kind of data is coming out the back end here. Your thoughts on that? Yeah, and it's an interesting point um, that you and I work on a hugely uh, spread out array of different types of apps, and we almost have like complement each other of what we work on. So, like you said, data from the kids' apps is zero, Um, data from the financial stuff is minimal, um, usually. (laughs) put in as an afterthought anyway, but it's not, you know, publicly available or anything where you tend to work, like you just said, in this area where data collection um, is a huge deal um, done right and very valuable. And we'll talk about that when we deal with analytics uh, in a couple of weeks. That's pretty much what we want to talk about with new ideas. Uh, We thank you for listening or watching. Your time is valuable and we appreciate you spending that with us. If you would, we'd appreciate it if you went to the iTunes store found us, gave us a review, um, rated us. We'd appreciate that. And thank you. Thanks for joining.